Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Laura, who are we talking to today? Well, this episode is perfect for any of our listeners who are interested in surface pattern design. Like us. (laughs) Like us. Today, we're speaking with Elizabeth Silver, a professional surface pattern designer and a licensed artist for the stationery, gift, and textile markets. With 18 years in the industry and hundreds of designs in her portfolio, she also teaches beginner surface pattern designers how to move past overwhelm and obstacles to create a profitable creative business. She's passionate about keep it real business advice and moving forward even in a messy way. She's also passionate about ice cream. Elizabeth, welcome to the Stardust Society. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So we'd like to start our interviews by having our guests share their Stardust story with us. But first, we need to know your favorite flavor of ice cream. (laughs) Mm, Good question. I mean, I like something that's like a vanilla base with like a lot of like extra like candies or chocolates in it. You know what I mean? Like or like like moose tracks or like a peanut butter (laughs) pub Uh or something like that. Like I'm I'm vanilla base, but just add in all the chocolate extras. All right. That sounds delicious. What about you, Laura? What's your favorite ice cream? Okay, my favorite growing up was mint chocolate chip. Um. My brother and I had that every time we went to the, what was the 32 flavors, Bas- Baskin Robbins? Baskin Robbins. Yes. Oh yeah, Baskin Robbins. I used to get the rainbow sherbet at yeah. Baskin Robbins. Loved Thank Baskin Robbins, one. mint chocolate chip, but I'm kind of turned into like a butter pecan girl now. That's, Ooh. but because I live in Texas, it has to be Bluebell. That's it. Gotcha. Bluebell ice cream. So if you haven't had Bluebell, you got to have it. All right. Mine is 100% coffee. I know you expected me to say bourbon, but <laughs> coffee ice cream. <laughs> and if you can mix in some Heath bars. Mm, now we're know, talking. Or bourbon. <laughs> All right, but let's get back on topic. <laughs> Elizabeth. <I> mean, <laughs> this is the stuff people want to know. I'm telling you. I know. You. This is this is hard hitting news. <laughs> Journalism right here. Yeah. Right, right, right. All right. So we know you've been a surface pattern designer for quite some time, like 18 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, And you even studied surface pattern design in school, which I didn't even know that was a major. Yeah. (laughs) Neither did I really. I mean, it was, it was actually a stroke of luck. I think, um, uh, I was thinking about this and, you know, I was, I was lucky, uh, to have grown up. I have a sister who's 10 years older than me and she was a graphic designer and Mm -hmm. my mom made, uh, my mom studied art education. She didn't end up she ended up being a regular elementary school teacher rather than an art teacher, but she studied it. So I never had that thing that you hear sometimes from artists who like, I didn't know this could be a job. Like I always knew art could be a job. And mm-hmm. so I was pretty, you know, sure that that would be my job, you know? And That's awesome. so, um, I w- ended up going to Syracuse university. I was, a very like didn't want to go to co- I, I was definitely going to college I was like you know had really good grades and all this stuff and just like typical path but like I also was totally dragging my feet about it so I didn't apply very many places and then only got into two places um and one was a state was Yukon a state school and one was Syracuse and I was like I'm going to Syracuse like I basically my mom was like well you should at least check it out and like go to it maybe you want to go to Yukon I, I was like no I'm just going to Syracuse that's it like whatever <laughs> Where did you grow up? Connecticut. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I spent so, my childhood summers in Connecticut. I went to camp in Connecticut. Oh, nice. And so, yeah, yeah. UConn was like called Husky High. Like, it's like everyone goes to the <laughs> state school, you know? So right. I was like, that's like the safety, you know, I just was like, no, I'm going to go to a, a university, like a real, you know, whatever. There's, this is no shade against any <laughs> state schools, like whatever. This was just my mindset when I'm 17. Anyways, it ended up being very, uh, you know, uh, very fortunate because I studied ad design for about one semester and took a 
elective in surface pattern and I had never heard of it either. Um, but it was just the absolute perfect thing because honestly, graphic design, I wanted to do, I always wanted to do something functional. I was never like into fine artistry as, as you know, in high school or anything like that. I wasn't, I feel like I've always been more of a left brained creative. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea of designing for a product for something that people are going to buy is like just so perfect, but all the cute stuff, right? That's, yeah, you know, just for decoration. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the perfect, uh, thing for me. So I was lucky to discover it early. That's awesome. So tell us how you, um, what happened after that? So you were in the perfect, you found the perfect major for, for me, for your yeah, skills exactly. for you. And then, and then what next? What was next? And then I graduated and I said, I'm going to take uh, the summer off and then I'll start looking for work. And in August, um, my, one of my college, uh, like, you know, classmates reached out and said, Hey, would you like to work for a bedding company? Because they need some help. And, you know, I put your name in kind of thing. So I sent my resume, I interviewed a few times, uh, and lugged a really, really heavy old school portfolio down to New York <laughs> through the commuter rail and everything like that, oh, all gosh. through the city. Um, these giant, you know, cause I painted in gouache at the time and this just giant portfolio. And, um, so I worked at a bedding company for two years and then did, um, home linens. I did tabletop for, uh, four years in New York and then I did kids apparel for two years. So I had a, wow. a good career working in-house for various companies, um, in New York until I was ready to leave that behind and get a house and potentially have a kid. And I didn't want to do it on the subway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went freelance and, uh, that has, has been a totally different experience. I thought, you know, I say I've been working for 18 years as a surface designer, but truly it's been two separate careers, like going into free, you know, leaving corporate and becoming an independent artist has been so uh, such a learning curve and so different than I expected. I thought it was kind of going to be an easy transition. Tell us about the transition. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've, I've told this story before, so if people have heard it, I'm sorry, but I, I worked for the, uh, for baby gap for the last two years of my career and mm -hmm. uh, it was a great job. I really loved working there and people were wonderful. And I got to see all my, like I was the baby designer. So every Thing in the in baby gap you made designer my babies designs. i made designer babies <laughs> nice they were very I fashionable think there's, there's a big market for that <laughs> they were very fashionable i'm telling you it was a great prop for fashion week um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So anyways, I, I had a lot, I had, you know, I knew different people working, um, who had worked at Gap and then moved to other companies in, in New York. And some of them were big name, like Victoria's Secret and stuff like that. And I just kind of was like, well, I'm just gonna work a little bit for the Gap for a while until they find my replacement. Um, and I'm going to be in New York for a little bit before we actually make a move. So I'll have some time to make some connections and I'm just going to find two or three clients and, you know, do 15 hours a week for each of them or something or go in seasons or however, you know, whatever works for them. I'm very flexible. Don't Sounds you know? perfect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then um, there's my living and I'm good. And uh, it, the reality. It, yeah. The reality was, <laughs> I mean, you know, I did. I was lucky. I still was lucky to start out with. Yeah. The first couple of years I did a lot of work for the gap. So I had a good base with that. And then I was able to make some connections, you know, from other colleagues and have some big projects, but they were something like, Oh, it's a big project. And then nothing for six months or a year from that same oh, company yeah. or hmm. just totally fell off and never worked with them again. And so then it's like scrambling to find other opportunities and clients and, and connect with people. And that, it, um, you know, it takes a long time to build up the client base that is, repeat clients, pay you well, you know, respect your work mm -hmm. and are fun. To, you like what you're doing. And, you know, so. So about how long did it take to get to that place where you felt like, you know, you, you had that clientele? Um, I mean, 
the point where I really felt like I'm doing all client work and I don't have time for anything else wasn't really until 2018 or 2019. So mm-hmm. that, uh, so that's just a random year. That makes no sense. But it was, it was about four <laughs> or five years, four or okay. five years into it. But like that was all client work and freelance work. In the meantime, like when I was first starting, I was also starting to develop a licensing portfolio. So when I wasn't working on my, my plan was, okay, it's a 50, 50 business, 50% is going to be freelance and 50% is going to be licensing. So when I don't have client work, I'm going to just work on my own portfolio and that's going to mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, eventually sell out, sell, you know, license. Um, and so that was a good plan. It just didn't really like licensing, <laughs> licensing hasn't brought me like a ton of income. And so it has, while it has certainly taken up 50% of my time throughout the years, it mm. hasn't been 50% of my income by any stretch. So, mm-hmm. um, I just started leaning harder into freelance work and taking more freelance work on and doing less for my own portfolio. And so that's what brought me to a point where I was like, okay, now I have too much client work <laughs> and okay. Okay, we're done for now. Like, okay, you know, I'm full. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about the licensing because I think you have an agent. Is that right? That is correct. I am represented by Jewel Branding and Licensing. Okay. And how did that come about? Did you search out them or did they approach you or what was that process? Yes, I searched them out. So like uh, i a lot of people who got into surface pattern design around the same time I did. Well, I mean, I was into it, but, you know, starting a freelance career, I took Lilla Rogers um, very first um, Matt's course, mm-hmm. Make Art and Cells, mm-hmm. and in 2013. And um, it was a great course, very inspiring, as I'm sure you have heard if you haven't taken it yourself. It is very inspiring. And so she inspired pretty much like a generation of like independent right. artists to get into licensing and which, you know, for better or for worse. And so I was like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I can just make my own portfolio. And then it'll take some time to make the portfolio because like m- most of I had a portfolio, but it wasn't anything that I owned, right? It was all stuff I had done for corporate. So I could show people that I know how to draw, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't license that work. You didn't have anything to sell. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I was like, once I do some patterns, like we're just gonna, you know, I'm going to be living off that sweet, sweet licensing cash. (laughs) 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 <laughs> so, um, and you know, I've had great deals and I have, I continue to have good deals. Um, and I think that from what I've, I also do interviews with artists on my YouTube channel and from what I have learned talking, I always am asking people basically getting up in their business about their income and stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. so from what I have learned from people who really do make licensing a big portion of their income mm-hmm. is it's such a numbers game. Like it's so much artwork. It's constant like churn of artwork. That's what it seems like. I don't think that maybe there are different types of licensing artists, I think. Um, but since it was something that I spent a lot of time with upfront, but I haven't been, I don't contribute to my portfolio new stuff as much as, you know, um, as much as I used to, I'm, I'm going to chalk it up to that as the reason that I'm not, you know, a licensing superstar. Well, we've looked at a lot of, in preparing for this, we looked at a lot of your, um, you know, interviews you've done and your Ooh. YouTube, your YouTube channel, which by the way is fantastic. I just yeah, want to throw in Thank there you. that you. you have a ton of great videos and great topics from like Illustrator, Photoshop, workflow, tutorials, portfolio and business advice. Um, and I love the interviews that you do with other designers for sure. But, um, but so from, from all of that, I've learned that you are definitely more freelance than licensing. Yeah, 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 I would say so. And so um, I guess you started with that and then you you got um, signed with the agent. And like, how do you figure out that balance? And how does the freelance work come to you? Is that also through the agent or? No, so yeah, different, different agencies definitely have different agreements. But the way that my um, agreement with Jewel works is that my freelance work is fully my own. Um, okay. so they don't get any cut of that and it's clients that I've sought out myself. Um, and I usually say like, 
75% of my art income is freelance and like 25% of my art income is um, licensing. Mm -hmm. So those clients have come through me reaching out, through them finding me on Instagram, through connections with um, other artists um, who say like, oh, this client you know, I'm, I can't work with this client, but would you, you know, like, let me hook you up with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and things like that. And, um, so that is, that's how I've gotten that work. And I just, as far as finding the balance, it's really just in the past, it's been, you know, just the idea of working 40 hours a week, sort of, it's like, okay, if I don't have any client projects due, then, Hey, why don't I brainstorm about a licensing collection? Um, I have some time, you know, so why not? Let's think of something new. Um, but as client work picks up and, and like I said, in 2018 and 2019, it was starting to like really get like mm -hmm. a really full schedule of client work. Um, that's when, you know, I wasn't doing as many new collections. So I have a question. When you say freelance, um, just to clarify for our listeners, you mean basically work that you've done that is a buyout, right? Like that they own the, the copyright to it. Um, is that an accurate statement? Uh, yes, that is. It's not it doesn't always have to be tr like that, but that is true for me. I usually sell my copyright, but a little bit more specifically, I'm doing it to the specification of the client and it's not always a pattern. I mean, like, it's not always like a, oh, we want something with monkeys. Can you design some monkeys? And then I sell it to them for whatever, $700. Mm -hmm. it, a lot of time it's ongoing sort of like production work, um, to some degree, or like, you know, I'm creating art for a whole suite of products. And so it's like, you know, fitting things in together and trying these different designs for different products and stuff like that. So, so in fact, I do a ton of like party paper stuff. So mm -hmm. I do like, you know, birthday plates and napkins and stuff and all the things that go along with that. And then like all the decorations that might go along with that. And then, you know, gift bags and wrapping paper and stuff like that. So a lot of times it'll be like, all right, we need five designs for like Christmas gift bags in this trend like theme um, okay. and stuff like that. But they're giving me creative briefs. Um, it's not so much my own um, right. from my own head. OK, yeah, that that makes sense um, that you're working basically off of a brief. Mm -hmm. So our main focus with most of what we talk about is just about getting started. Yeah. And so we've That's talked a little bit. It. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. We've, we talked about your story about getting started, but let's talk about some advice for our listeners who are trying to create a career for themselves like yours, where it's either freelance or licensing or a combination. Um, it can be super intimidating. There are so many things that you need to do. You got to, you got to learn the the technology. You've got to learn how to actually make patterns. You got to create websites, put together portfolios, research companies. It's hard to know like where to start and when you're ready and how to like put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. So what can you what can you put what can you give us some tips about how to know when you're ready and give advice to some people who are just getting started? I love that. Yes. And that's why I really love this podcast because you guys talk about a lot of the same themes that I like are really important to me, which is pretty much the idea of moving forward, getting started, you know, taking imperfect action, mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. over all those fears and just like putting yourself out there. So right. I love that you guys have so much content on that. And, and it's definitely like a favorite topic of mine. So as far as advice for people, I, you know, start now is all there is. <laughs> it's like, I, that does, I mean, that's overwhelming and like crazy, but like when you, you kind of said, you know, how do you people know when they're ready? It's like, you're ready yesterday. Like if you, well, yeah, it's <laughs> like they, t they say like the best kind of investing advice, the best time to start was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The second best time is now. Right now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's exactly that. And so that's what I feel about, um, you know, people who are creating their work, and, and trying to decide, like, am I still someone who's doing this for a hobby or am I going to make this a career or can I make this a career or should I just make 75 more patterns? And the answer to me is always like, don't make 75 more patterns yet. You'll get there. You're going to have plenty of time in your whole life to make 75 more patterns. You will be making those patterns. <laughs> but like start now with the like thinking that this is going to be your like 
you know, if, if it's something that really speaks to you, that this is going to be your career, start with moving forward with trying to connect with clients and, and doing those, those, um, you know, steps to get yourself lined up. And I know that it can be overwhelming. This is, um, something I talk about in my course, start your service pattern business. But the reason I created that course is because there are so many different things that you can do to get your business started. And as I know, you guys know from talking to so many different artists, there's so many ways to, to profit in this business. And yet it's still really difficult and overwhelming because the options are like everywhere. So, you know, well, the great I, thing is there's so many different ways. And the yeah, scary thing is there's, there's so, so many, many different, different ways. ways. That's exactly. <laughs> I mean, I literally say that. And yes, totally. Yeah. And it it's it can be, you know, paralyzing. So boiling it down to the simplest steps and just like remembering you don't have to overthink things and like things like a website. Did you hear that, Laura? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you don't have to oh overthink. Oh, my gosh. I need that tattooed on my forehead pretty much. I know. <laughs> yeah. I forget it, too. Don't don't get me wrong. I definitely need to take my own advice more often. But yeah. um, like, you know, something like a website, a portfolio website. I think this is something that sends people into such a tailspin of like, oh, my God, I've never made a website before. Now I got to find a web designer. I don't have a brand. I don't know this, that, the other. And it's like, wait, wait, wait. Do we know a web designer? <laughs> I think we do. I think her name's Nikki. Nikki May. Oh. Oh. Oh, well, if you need a web designer now, I'm not trying to take away from your business, but <laughs> if you need a web designer and Nikki is unavailable after you call her, just know that it doesn't, the first draft of your website doesn't have to be this incredible thing. You know what I mean? You, you just start where you are, you know, it's okay. Exactly. And actually, Elizabeth, the um, the course that you just mentioned about starting your service design, service pattern design business, Laura and I have been poking around in it. And I watched today your super great advice on putting together that just your first version of a website where, I mean, you give great advice about how to start simply and you don't have to have all the bells and whistles. You don't have mm -hmm. to do everything. And you do a great job of breaking down, here are just the basics you need to get started. Yeah. So, I mean, you well, give some really great... from a web designer, I very much yeah. appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's low tech. It's like, just go for it. It's really not that serious. And, and I will say that, you know, that wasn't something that I concentrated on. You know, it wasn't like my main focus in putting together this course. But when I've heard students say like, I have my first web, I did it. I did module two and I made my first website. It's like super gratifying because I know that's such a huge hurdle for people because it's well, so hard. It is. It's, it's intimidating. So well, like, that's, yeah. and, and it's, it's harder, it's harder in theory than in practice, but it's, it, yes. so many people are so afraid of it. It's a mental yeah. block yeah. for sure. That, they, so. that, that instead they make 75 more patterns because exactly. it's easier <laughs> for them to do than to think about yes. what can actually move their career forwards. Yes. Oh, it totally. took me a whole year to do my last website because I had it built up so big in my head that the tech was going to be so difficult. And I mean, it, it took me a while to do it, but not nearly, it wasn't nearly as difficult as I really thought it was. Um, yeah, really, but, Laura, I watched you do it. And once you actually got started, yeah, you figured it out and you put it together pretty quickly and did a great job. Yeah, thank you. So when we talk about websites, one of the main reasons to have one is to have that portfolio you were talking about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about portfolios and and, you know, what do you really need to to start, you know, before you begin pitching? You said, don't go out and make 75 designs. You know, is there is there a right number to, to start, do you think? Of course, there's not really, but I do tend to say like 10 designs, 10 solid designs. You know, they might not be your first 10 designs that you've ever created. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously people have to sort of experiment a little bit and figure out how to actually put together a pattern and work it a little bit in their drawing skills, you know, who knows. But but if you have 10 decent patterns that mm -hmm. you're happy with, that you feel proud of for where you are, not saying I look on Instagram and I don't feel proud because how many talented people are on Instagram, but if you're proud of the work that you've done and, and yeah. it, it fits in with what you've seen in the market in some way, um, 10 is, is enough. And when you say 10 designs, do you mean like a, um, just a single design or like a small collection or 
It could be either, honestly, um, a mix of both. I sort of recommend, like, if if a student was asking me, I mean, what I mean, what's the difference? But a student <laughs> is asking you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm like, oh, I don't know why. <laughs> but I mean, okay, so like, ideal situation is what I would say yeah. is yeah, you, know, you can have five five individual patterns that aren't uh, a collection and then maybe five mini collections where you have one hero image a secondary mm-hmm. and then something uh, more simple or like one placement print and two patterns or something like you know like a, a group of three I think that's enough to get started now that really depends on what your goals are so is it licensing is it to find an agent? Is it freelance work? Mm -hmm. That's something you have to consider. Um, Like freelance work, you're only showing your artwork to show what your skill set is because they're going to ask you to create new art based on what they need. So you just need to be able to show them that you can draw and can put something into repeat. Uh For licensing, people are looking to use what you actually have. So Mm -hmm. 10 Designs is not a huge bank of designs for a company to look through. Mm -hmm. I will give you that. But making that connection and having someone actually pay attention to your work can take some time. So get started now and you'll continue, you know, you're not going to have 10 designs for the next year. You're going to have 10 designs now and next month you'll have 12 designs and then 14 designs. And so Mm -hmm. you have something new to send and make that relationship um, happen. And then as far as agents, I have heard such different things. My own personal agent, I interviewed her and she said she likes to like really hit the ground running and she likes to see an artist who has at least 50 pieces. And then I've Mm. talked to um, other agents uh, who think, you know, they, they kind of like to start with you and help you grow. And so seeing like 10 really great pieces is enough and, Mm -hmm. and moving forward from that. So um, that just kind of depends on, I guess, you know, who you're, who you're talking to. And I'm curious when you do freelance work, um, do they ask for a lot of collections? Like, do you work in collections mostly or or is it single designs? Um, it depends. It depends. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said, I'm, I'm really designing a lot for product. I'm not doing as much where it's really just a flat repeat. Um, sometimes, you know, I do design for apparel and so that would just be a flat repeat, but um, a lot of times if we're thinking about plates and gift bags and stuff like that, the front of the gift bag is something that's really exciting and detailed, but they might ask me to design the side of the gift bag, which is like going to be like a coordinating pattern or the right. gift tag, which is going to be like a, just a little shape that's related to that, you know, things like that. Or if, you know, sometimes I'm asked to do just like the main dinner plate of a like party collection versus, you know, the napkins and the smaller like dessert plate or whatever. And sometimes I do it all. So it just depends. And and from a I'm a finance girl, too, in my day job. So Mm -hmm. I'm always curious about these things. Um, Do they consider these coordinates as separate items that they they purchase outright or or do they purchase like as a bundle? Um, usually as a bundle or depending, yeah, as a bundle, or in some cases I do still charge hourly depending. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they might come to you and say, okay, we're putting together this holiday, like gift presentation. Yeah. And so it's X amount for this whole product suite or something. Yes, exactly. And then when you get really comfortable with your clients, they can say, can you do all this and just bill me at the end? Tell me what it costs. And that's, that's a good spot to be in. I want to catch up. (laughs) So you don't have to worry about, you just do it, figure out, and then you know how long it took or how complicated the patterns were. And then you can just be like, all right, that's, that's around this much. Let's just. I I want that job. Yeah. That's after you've got a relationship with them and they know how you've you've done it for a while. Cause at first you're giving the real like back and forth of like, all right, this is going to be this much. Does that work for you? Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then after a while they get used to, they know that your price range is in their budget or whatever it is and, you know, works out. So what, what do you think is the way that most people want to, want to pay you? Is it more hourly or is it more a whole project or like, what's the majority um, I know everything's different, but yeah, that's a th- I know it is. It really is. Um, it it really it depends. You know, I kind of go with whatever the client prefers. I mean, there's a conventional wisdom, which I do understand that, you know, hourly isn't 
the most ideal way to charge for the artist because as you get better and more proficient, you're faster. And so then you're getting penalized for not for your efficiency. Yeah, exactly. And I am a very fast worker. So, I mean, I'm the first to say that that's not always the best thing. Um, but what I do is, you know, I've just made sure, and I always recommend to everyone. It's like, continue to raise your prices. Like if you've been working with someone for three years, you should have raised your prices three times, at least, you know, your rate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with projects, you can kind of do that a little bit more easily and gradually with an hourly. It's like, they're probably going to expect if you're working multiple times together, you're having the same hourly. So you have to have that conversation really specifically. Mm -hmm. Whereas with projects, you can just start quoting a little higher and see how it goes, I guess. But um, that makes sense. But, you know, as long as you're raising your prices, um, you know, sometimes it really is easier for me just because of some of the type of work that I do can be really, um, you know, a lot like back and forth and then like add in this at the last minute. And there's a lot of tight turnarounds in these kind of situations. And so sometimes hourly really just is like almost simpler. Like if I was trying to figure it out, it's like, well, I'm not really sure because then you added in the gift tags and then there's, it. you know, like sometimes I, I don't mind the kind of like easiness of an hourly fee. Pricing really is the hardest so thing hard. to figure out. And it's super tricky. Do you talk about that in the course that we that we're taking? Because we're we're getting it dripped to us. So we yeah. haven't reached that <laughs> we haven't reached that. <laughs> haven't yeah. gotten to the end yet. So all will be revealed <laughs> in a few weeks. <laughs> awesome. Um, I do know uh so the whole course is about getting started and uh-huh. and and finding those clients and then the, the, at the end, I have something. So as not to leave you hanging when you do find something, (laughs) but I don't really go deep into it, but I do have what I call the first client's foundation kit. And so that gives you, um, a bunch of contracts that I've, uh, actually just upgraded this last couple months with, with, um, an attorney. So I know it's all totally checks out for freelancing, hourly for flat fee, for licensing, for, um, those contracts where if, uh, someone wants to show your work, but don't, doesn't want to buy it yet, because sometimes, um, companies want to show they, they work for companies or for retailers. And so they want to show it to the retailer and get it approved mm-hmm. before they commit to paying you. Mm-hmm. Um, so contracts for that kind of stuff anyways. And then I kind of go into sort of, uh, like a, an overview of my, my, you know, biz, how I kind of like keep my accounting and stuff like that. Like it's, it's simple, but it doesn't need to be complicated. And that's sort of the nice. thing. And so I do talk about pricing there a little bit and dig in and what I, I say, sort of briefly on the subject. And this is like evolving for me as well. I think the conversation continues to evolve as I get to hear, as more people feel much more comfortable talking about it, which I love. Um, after working in house, I based my pricing a lot on how studio textile design studios sell their work. Because when I worked in house, you know, we would just buy art flat out from, from, um, design studios. And I knew the price ranges for that, which is like around 500 to $1,200 depending. Mm -hmm. And so I always sort of kept in that range and, you know, now it really, it depends, but I really do kind of, kind of stick with that. And, and there's, you know, it's really just like an evolving conversation, trying to find out what other people are charging. Sometimes, you know, people are charging much lower than me. And then sometimes I'm, I really feel like, oh, I'm at the higher end. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, there's way higher to go, like with my hourly and everything. So in case we weren't already confused. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like I'm just trying to get as much information as I can and like, you know, push it and, and not be afraid to have those conversations and not be afraid to move forward and know that, you know, when I first started freelancing, I charged way too little, but I, if someone does that today, I don't blame them for it, for starting, you know, starting really low. I think there's a lot of like pricing pressure in this industry of like, don't even think about selling. You're like ruining the industry. If you sell a print for less than a thousand dollars and it's like, well, that puts a lot of pressure on a new artist, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, if you're and just starting out and you don't have that track record, you don't want to yeah. start so low, yeah. but you got to you got to have a baseline it, and you can always go up from there. Yeah. Exactly. And it it is it is really a difficult situation like yeah. a, you know, topic um and I certainly am not one to have all the answers on that. Everything else I have all the answers, but pricing Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I just watched your uh, interview with Shannon McNabb. 
where you were talking, like you guys did an Instagram live, I think. Oh, and yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you were talking about the difference between... Um, having an the, agent and Between not having, having an agent. agent and not having an agent, which was really great. But I would say that like your course is perfect for somebody getting started. And then her artful pricing course can be like a jumping off point Step after two. that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I don't, and neither of us teach, well, maybe she does in some capacity, but we don't, I don't teach how to, um, actually design design. Like I give hot tips in my, in my YouTube uh-huh. and stuff like that, but I don't yep. teach like the very basics of how to create a pattern. So that's, you know, other courses yeah. that are available yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Although you do have some interesting, um, some interesting YouTube videos about like workflow. And so it's not the basics of putting a design together, but I like that you've got some, some information about taking those design skills and, and developing your workflow from it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this transition because you've, you've been a freelance artist for so long and now you're also um, teaching others how to do that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, how that transition came about for you? Yeah, definitely. So As I have said, like in around 2018, 2019, I started having, you know, like a full client load, um, sort of like finally, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was working 40 hours or more on client work and I was at capacity and then it was sort of like, okay, and um, now what? (laughs) Like, like I can't take on more client work. I can't take on more client yeah. work. Like I can raise my prices and stuff, but they're, you know, like I'm, um, there's nothing scalable here really. Yeah. Like so I can how have, do you, how do you scale when your exactly. hours are all occupied? Yeah. So, you know, the time for money thing that we've all heard about. So mm-hmm. I had done a couple courses prior um, to that in 2016 and 2017, um, smaller courses, like two and a half hours, um, they had a really great reception. Um, you know, they were really, I I was really proud of them, still am proud of them. And so I knew that I had like a a much kind of like larger scale course in me. Um, Mm -hmm. I hadn't been focusing on it for a while because I was like deep in client work, but I just was like ready to do it. And so I was like, I'm going to do this. And, um, and so 2020, I headed in with like, Oh, gusto. I was so ready. I got a business coach. I'm like, I'm going to nail this. I'm going to do like a live launch. And, um, and I did, but also COVID. (laughs) (laughs) But also COVID. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not, not to take away from it. Cause I did, uh, you know, my first launch I'm very proud of. Um, but it was literally the week of like that America shut down. So, um, (laughs) I got a little bit of a head start on it. Hashtag, yeah. but also COVID. <laughs> yeah. I got a little head start on it. Tom Hanks was not yet sick when I did my first webinar, but <laughs> by the time we were closing cart, we were all under a rock because we were scared. So, um, no, but actually it ended up being like a really, uh, you know, fortunate thing because I had already started making this shift. Um, and so client work did, well, I, I would say client work, was slow because of COVID and because everyone was kind of scrambling, Mm -hmm. but also I had zero time because suddenly I had two children all up in my life. (laughs) They were in my life before, but it was, you know, like after dinner. But they went to school. (laughs) Yeah. So they were running around. And how old are they? Um, at the, they're four and six now, but it was three and five. And yeah. Wait, and you still have your sanity. That's that's amazing. Yeah, well, it was a really that's rough year. That's debatable. It was, yeah, I mean, we can just talk about that. But it was a really, really rough year. So I did not have the extra time for client work. I wasn't reaching out to, I mean, I didn't, if people reached out to me, I would, you know, do what they needed me to do. But I, I was not reaching out to anyone to say like, hey, just checking in. Does anyone need any, you know, like I wasn't, wasn't doing any of that. So it was really fortunate that I had this, um, course and that first, um, that first spring semester was really, really fun because everyone was kind of like, Oh, we're all in this. And this is something that's really distracting us. And this is, you know, giving us a time to like, you know, focus inward on our own businesses and, and not Mm -hmm. worry so much about what's happening with the rest of the world. And so that just ended up being really fortunate timing. And are you doing open and closed launches or it's evergreen? 
Um, now it's evergreen. Um, I do like promotional weeks. Um, so mm-hmm. just like last month I did a bonus week, which basically is like when I'm doing like a webinar and doing some fun stuff, I've done challenges before stuff to kind of get some attention, but also, um, having, you know, people who register at that like week, that specific week, get some extra fun bonuses. Okay. Um, oh, that's cool. So a little bit of motivation, but then I always say like, okay, well, this is the end of the bonuses, but you can still buy it tomorrow. And people do. <laughs> so <laughs> people are, people still like, they wait till the last day and then like, they'll, I'll still get a couple after a few, yeah, few days yeah. after with that finally caught up. So yeah, yeah. but it is well, always open. <laughs> cool. And we'll absolutely link to that and to your other courses in our show awesome. notes. Yeah. But let's, let's step back a little bit to talk more about, um, about artists just getting started. Yes. Um, and let's talk about narrowing down, narrowing down what you want to do, narrowing down your niche and figuring out mm. what's my, what's my style? What should I do? What, yeah. What sectors do I want to work in? Do you have any advice about that? Yeah, it can be really tricky. And, and I've had the good fortune of working in a lot of different product categories over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, so finding, you know, I think there can be a limited view of what you can do with your art. Like as much as people are like, oh, it can, you can put it on anything. It's art, you know, it's a pattern. It can go on anything. I think people still think like wallpaper, quilting fabric, and, like, I don't know. I don't know what the top things that people think about for surface pattern, but quilting fabric is, you know, and it's yeah. like, or maybe yeah. like scrapbook paper. I don't know. Or like home decor. Yeah. yeah. Upholstery, I guess. Or like pillows. Yeah. Bedding. Yeah. Looking at your art, your stuff, you have a very distinct style and it's, it's easy to tell the, the background you came from because your work is young and cute and vibrant and, um, you know, you have, a, you yeah, have bright a very, colors. Thank yeah, you. Mm-hmm. you have a very distinct style. Um, so there's certain industries that, that lends itself to, but like what comes first? Do you choose an industry and make your style work with that? Do you look at the style that you naturally have and pick an industry? Like what kind of recommendation do you have? Or if you're doing freelance, can you do more than one style? Because, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm going to I'll start with Laura. Freelance. I will say I will say those questions. (laughs) All of them are great. Um, No, 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 no. (laughs) But um, so like, yeah, finding your style is like a major stress point for new artists as well. And I um, I am surprised to even hear you say like you have a very distinct style because me I having come from working in house I've done so many different styles that um, it has been really hard to narrow in on what I really enjoy because I like to try it all and truly what I show on like Instagram and my website are the things that I see as the most like me let's say Mm -hmm. but if you saw my full licensing portfolio you'd see some stuff in there that you'd be like who why (laughs) like (laughs) what it's like hand painted looking and it looks really really different from what you what you see um yeah when I say you have a very distinct style that's what you've chosen to show us yes exactly it's a very curated style maybe I don't know what is all in that whole big portfolio but what you're showing it's a it's a bit of a mess there's a lot in there (laughs) there's a lot in there you can get a little bit of everything it's a candy store um so well who doesn't like a candy store I mean I'm gonna that's like my new tagline I I, (laughs) I'm so excited about this now um (laughs) Yeah. So I, uh, so actually having multiple styles is really great for freelance for licensing. It seems like zeroing in on a style can be, um, the, you know, a a better way to go to Mm -hmm. sort of have your own art brand. Um, but as far as picking like what lane to go, and I think it's a matter of, you do have to start with creating the work, um, and, and, you know, just having fun and doing, you know, as you're learning, pattern design and and motifs and stuff doing the work and seeing what you enjoy drawing do you like doing more botanical stuff do you like doing more abstract do you like um cute 
you know, bunnies, like what, what's, what's the thing that really like lights you up? What makes you, um, you know, excited. And then once, once you have, you know, seven or 10 designs and you're starting to like know which, which ones you, you lean towards and which ones you like, I think you can evolve your style by picking out, you know, your top two or three from that and seeing what about those designs do you, enjoy so much like why why are those ones standing out to you is it because of the motifs is it because of the type of line work you did is it because of the tech techniques or the scale or whatever and sort of building on that and so that is a way to sort of speed up the evolution of your styles like looking at your last five pieces and choosing your favorites and then seeing why you know trying to like get those same elements into your next pieces and um And then there's some like hallmarks of certain industries where, um, you know, certain industries do look towards certain um, types of artwork. Right. So fun Mm -hmm. juvenile is going to be more for, well, obviously kids is one thing. Um, If you're really into I have like a, a little quiz on my website to help people narrow down their niches and basically, uh, you know, kind of revolves around like if you're into like celebrations and stuff and like holidays and you really like the idea of doing all these different holidays, then like, you know, gift wrap and party paper could be something for you. If Mm -hmm. you like more abstract stuff and geometrics, then like apparel or home decor could work for you. Um, you know, there's some other, you know, certain motifs and certain colors and certain, uh, styles really work for particular industries or product categories, I should say. Yeah. Nice. I'm really curious of the work, you know, you've done this now for 18 years. Is there a particular project that you're sort of most proud of that you worked on? Hmm. Good question. Love that. I think my, Oh, it's so hard to choose now, but I really love to do, um, I have a partnership with, Camelot fabrics and I do, uh, you know, quilting fabrics with them. And I've done now we've worked together for three or four years. I've done probably 10 or 11 collections with them. Mm -hmm. And it's something that it's sort of what it's, it was such a big goal of mine to get, to get a, you know, fabric licensing deal. And, you know, it was something I worked towards and was like actively, you know, like I really, you know, I'm doing a lot of prints. I'm thinking about this as fabric, Mm -hmm. like I'm designing with this in mind. And so when I finally had that deal in hand and my first collection we designed, well, it was already designed. It was from my portfolio, but we kind of tweaked and then it was actually fabric. And then I got the samples and stuff like that. It's like so amazing. And now, you know, I get samples every six months or five months. I have stacks of them. I don't know how to sew. So it's, it's just really that piling was gonna up. That be my next but, question. <laughs> yeah, no, I know I don't. And but, so but um, really what's more exciting than seeing those first samples yes. actually in print? Yeah. I mean, that's the best. So it's like, it's something that this many, you know, this many collections later, it it is a little like, oh, here's another one. It's a little less fanfare, but truly, if I think about it, it's still like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And when, and when people like see it in stores and tag me and stuff like that, it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, seeing it in store, no matter what you're designing, when you see it in stores or somebody else sees it and sends you a picture, that's, that's like, we don't do this job for like riches, but we do it for like the, the like dopamine of like seeing it in stores basically oh yeah the first time the first time i i walked into a kmart which was you know 20 something years ago (laughs) 30 years ago and saw a t-shirt i designed in kmart i was like you've made it oh my god i made it it. i didn't actually make any money off of it but (laughs) But, but it, it was there. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing. We're like, um, you know, the samples are eighty percent of the the like, you know, benefit of it. If sometimes, right? right. Yeah, totally. So cool. So let's talk about always going back to artists getting started. What do we do to get in our own way that oh we can? And what can you tell us? What what advice can you give us to? to stop that shit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh Lord. We do get in our own way so much. Don't we? Um, Oh yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah, you guys have so many great episodes on this too, of just, you know, like the, the, the fears assuming just like making assumptions about what is really happening. Um, 
and, and all that. There's just like, there's so much that we do. I'm trying to think about what would be, um, at the end of the day, what works for me, and I don't think everyone has this personality, but what works for me is really action. I mean, with action mm-hmm. brings clarity. And yeah. I was actually just talking about this. Uh, well, this just rang true for me like yesterday because I've been sort of moaning about, oh, you know, I'm really in this creative slump. Like, I don't, you know, I haven't had this many ideas lately and everything I make, I don't really like and this, that, the other. And I'm, and I'm like, well, what should I do about it? And there's, you know, I have all these ideas of what I could do about it. This, oh, get some new art supplies and try something new, Mm -hmm. take a class, do this, do that. And, um, then I was actually listening to you guys' podcast uh, with Lisa Glantz and she was like, oh, you know, you need to, you need to draw every day. And I was like, well, of course I've heard this advice a million times. Right. Right. And Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I never have done that. But I was like, I should just do a little mini challenge for myself. I saw that in your Instagram story. Exactly. I was like, I'm going to do it. And then I was starting again with the action. Like, you know, I was starting to think like, okay, well, October's coming up. I think I want to do a Halloween, little Halloween Mm -hmm. one. I started to like pull up Instagram and start to look at what people are doing. No, 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 no. Don't look at Instagram (laughs) if you want to have action. Throw your phone across the floor. Do not try to look at what anyone else's challenge is. I got out a notebook. I wrote down seven prompts. And then I was like, oh, I could do starting October 1st. And then I was like, today's the 28th. We're starting today. What's the point of waiting? Nice. Like, just do it. Nice. And I've already That's made great. two patterns because it's been two days now. So great. I. Great. And I'm excited about it, you know? So they, That's I mean, awesome. I was like, I'm just doing, you know, 30 minutes. Like, put a time limit on it. Put a, you know, don't force yourself into more than, you know, if you get started in you're excited that's obviously great news but the same thing with any anything that you need to do put a time limit on it say i'm going to do 30 minutes of this and i'm doing it today and you know just just start just go for it just get that action because yeah. once you start doing it then you realize oh okay well i do need to tweak this a little you know you bring some clarity it gives you confidence because again now i'm like psyched to do the rest of my days i if i had done two ugly things i might be a little less psyched but i, <laughs> but I did some things and i was like oh yeah this isn't so hard and yes there's cute things for halloween and i can draw these cute things and it's okay and like this is fun this is what i love to do this is what i you know yeah. i really truly enjoy so So, you know, it brings that confidence back um, that you can do these things and and just getting started is the best way to do it. I don't know if that really (laughs) it's great advice for someone, um, anybody like me who's in Overthinkers Anonymous. (laughs) Mm, I I can I can get there, too. I really can. So that's why I was like, why am I not? This is my whole thing is like, just get started in action and move forward and move forward. Why am I sitting here like? pondering how am I going to get out of this funk? It's like, just start drawing. Just do something. Yeah. And anybody, anybody who's listened to this podcast knows that we are all about the challenges. So a 30 day Mm. challenge, a hundred day challenge, or, you know, if you're crazy like me, you'll do a 365 day challenge. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Or or just picking up your, you know, your iPad and your Apple pencil and doodling and just saying, I'm going to make something ugly right now. I don't care. Yeah. There's nothing. I don't have no attachment to it. It doesn't have to. Nobody has to see this thing, but I'm just going to yeah. make something. And it just sort of gets your juices flowing a little bit. And you never know. I mean, it, and it could be horrible or some mm-hmm. little aspect of that might spark something in you to go to the next step. Right. Yeah, totally agree with that. I mean, I was joking about overthinkers anonymous, but I think it's really it's really true People when do. you're when you're overthinking something and not doing it, you just get stuck in a cycle. And like you just mm. think and think and think and think and of all the reasons, you I know, agree. why you yeah, can't and you do start something. Throwing things, you, you give yourself, you, you know, limitations and, and roadblocks just yeah. just come up because you're like, well, now I need to. That's the thing with the website. It's so overwhelming because it sounds like a big project, but it really it mm-hmm. doesn't have to be if you just say, OK, well, I just need yeah. these four things. I need my top five designs. I need a little blurb from my about page. I need, you know, two sentences about what I do. And yeah, let's start with that. Just start. And a way to get in touch with you. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And an email. Yes. Call to action at every juncture. (laughs) Definitely. Um, So can you tell us a little bit more about the free resources that you offer to other service pattern designers that are starting down their creative path? Because I know we mentioned a little bit about YouTube and how fabulous that is. Can you tell us 
what all you offer? I have so I have too many pre resources. <laughs> there's no there's no such thing. I know, I know, but you know what? I want to like organize them a little bit because yeah. I feel like it's like yeah, if you land on my page and you've never been there, like people do email me and like oh, I'm so glad I found your page, but I know that like then if they come out with me with a question and I'm like, but I also I answer that in like six videos, so you just have to find it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, my YouTube channel has a ton of stuff, and I have a blog as well, and the blog a lot of it is, um, you know, based on the YouTube, you know, YouTube videos, but there are some like standalone blog articles, um, where I like answer questions and address different things. And, um, I have a service pattern boss toolkit is like what you get when you sign up for my newsletter. And that has some different resources in it as well. It has some bonus videos from, um, YouTube interviews I've done where we kind of dig more into income so that, um, my lovely guests don't have to talk about their income on like the full public, uh, oh, YouTube. Nice. <laughs> so nice. if, if you sign into my like subscriber thing, you'll get some more like, you know, private details and, um, but also like templates and, um, like a course on, uh, like illustrator hacks and, and different stuff. So there's some free resources there too. trend guides. I used to do a ton of trend stuff. Now Very I do it cool. twice a year, but I love trends. And so, in fact, that's um, how I yeah. found you originally or heard about you originally. Somebody, um, told me that you had a trend guide and I went out yeah. and found that. So, um, yeah. so I think, I think that's awesome. Yeah. For four years, I did a trend at board every month for my newsletter and sorry guys at 2021 i was like all right enough of this <laughs> well, <let's, laughs> i can't do this anymore but, well, I did, talk, but i still do it you know for a couple twice a year talk to us about about trends how do you know okay we we can learn about trends from connecting with you and signing up for your newsletter but how do you figure that out? Is it, do you just kind of go out and research what's going on or? Yeah. So I, you know, I never pretend that I'm like a thousand years ahead of the curve with trends. Um, I mean, I just 999. Just 900. Yeah. No big deal. Um, no, but like, you know, they, so when I worked in house, you could buy these trend guides from these uh -huh. big corporations that cost like $2,000 and they're telling you what's mm -hmm. going to happen in like the year 3000 and <laughs> everything's super like abstract. I always like, like, you know, just digital jungle and like intergalactic this, that it's like the craziest, like you don't even know what they're talking about. Well, so because they're just making shit up. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> actually when I was doing my trend guide, I think at the, like at the end of last year, I think I was saying, I wonder how those trend guides are doing for the year 2020. Like, you know, just <laughs> what did they say was coming in, in 20, like 17? What did they predict and how did that shake out? But anyways, um, yeah, so me, I'm way, way, way. My trend stuff is way more like tangible motif based, like because sometimes, yeah, I get these trend guides. And like I said, it's like a random picture of holographic material and like a, <laughs> something and then some a picture of like a, a mural a wall like it's like what can I do with surface pattern on this this is a little too abstract for me so I do stuff like bees and like 70s fonts and like um I'm trying to think what was in my most recent um trend guide I'm like totally blanking but well you'll uh, have to share a link yeah with us you'll have to check can, it out this yeah, is like we'll a the, yeah. this is a spoiler um not a spoiler like a, a teaser. cliffhanger this is a cliffhanger yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. um well, we'll get that link from you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah. And the way I find it is really just like um, market research. So it's stuff that's already in stores. And so, you know, it's not a thousand percent ahead of the curve, but um, seeing it, you know, putting it together and seeing, seeing the things all lined up. It's like, okay, I can see that this is a trend. And also you can see, um, you know, these trends last longer than you think they do. You know, they're not yeah. necessarily like two seasons. They, they're usually three to five years. It seems like some of them hang on for. So yeah. it's like, you know, if you start designing something that, you know, I'm seeing some in stores and some on Instagram or, you know, in, on Etsy mm -hmm. and, and you start designing now, it, it's still totally relevant for like next season. Right. I remember so. when owls were out there for like five years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. 10 years. It might as well be. And cactuses are still, still hanging. I mean, they're definitely fading, but like cactuses, 
yeah had a good succulents, five, six all years. kinds of succulents yeah, succulents yeah. are yeah, they're, yeah those ones are fading too but it, but you know what i notice about trends and i talk about this too is it's it's an evolution right so it, it went from cactuses to succulents to now it's house plants right and what's mm-hmm. the next thing after house plants it's like just it's just moving it forward just a little bit and just right. a little bit different and yeah right. and that's actually something that is in my um my like free toolkit as well is how I use trends to brainstorm new ideas that aren't based on trends, but they, a lot of the times they end up lining up with trends because it's like a twist or an evolution of a what's already out there. To yeah, what's exactly. Out there. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Nice. Yeah. I'd always nice. heard that fashion was one of the places things start. So if you're looking yeah. at fashion and you see, let's say a lot of jungle cats all of a sudden on the mm-hmm. runway, then you you can think, okay, jungle cats are going to start showing up on water bottles, you know, or like yeah. they're going to start yeah. showing up on bedding that would, or that is like the traditional, um, you know, thinking and also the European markets being, being more advanced trend wise than the United States markets. So like when, when I was working in house, my design directors and creative VPs would go and see Heimtex, which is like a big show, like a housewares show in Germany and, you know, goes to, to see print shows that were in Europe because they were a little bit more forward. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of that has, um, you know, the internet has really tightened that cycle, um, fashion, is still ahead, but not as far ahead. Yeah, not as far ahead. It's it's yeah. You know, so. I went I went to art school in Italy in the in the late eighties. So I was there in nineteen eighty eight, and the things that I saw everywhere when I was in Italy, like four years later, I saw them here. Yeah, yeah. But that was pre internet. So now, yeah. yeah, now it's like as soon as as soon as it's all over Instagram, then it's here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think there is still like, you know, a cultural divide, like, you know, there is some things that are, you know, more popular in different areas and, and maybe start out more popular in Europe and stuff, but it does, right. it does seem to be kind of shrinking down. So. Awesome. So, um, Elizabeth, where can our listeners find you online? ElizabethSilver.com. Um, you can go there and you'll find my blog. Um, you can uh, links to my YouTube channel. You'll find my Instagram. I'm at eSilver Design um, because there was another Elizabeth Silver. And so here I am. And <laughs> Darn um, it. I know I, I want to reach back out to that person now, like 10 years later, because I'm I don't think she does anything. But um, I actually finally got my own name, by the way. You like, did? yeah, somebody else had it for like 10 years and posted. Tell once. me what that process was like. Did you DM them? No, they ended up. Um, uh, they Instagram canceled their account after like 10 years of inactivity. They hadn't used it because they hadn't so used long, it. Yeah. And I snuck in and grabbed it like as soon as they let did it go. Did you get like notified? How did you know? You just checked I just regularly. Check, I just checked regularly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't get mine. I couldn't get just Nikki May. So mine is Nikki May. Art. But E Silver Design's a great name. It is a great fine. name. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. I'm not too worried about so it. So we have one last question that we always like to end on. And we've talked about this a bit, but. Give us one piece of advice that you would give to people who are just getting started or the piece of advice you wish somebody had given you when you were just getting started. I think uh, persistence and perseverance is something that is super important in this industry um, or in any industry that you're working for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's self-built. You have to make those connections. You have to do those things. And understanding that things aren't necessarily personal. I think people take things really personal, but the thing, something that's really served me well has after having worked in-house is just knowing that like, it's not about my, the quality of my art. It really isn't. The decisions that are made are fully business decisions. They're made not anything to do with how beautiful one piece is versus another piece. And so, you know, we get in our own heads about, especially art is, you know, for many people, so personal. It's such an expression. So when we have to put ourselves out there and make those connections with clients or put, put our work on a a website or just, you know, get it out there to start making, you know, money with it. It feels like a personal rejection, a personal attack when we don't, you know, get chosen for whatever we've put ourselves out there for. Um, but the truth is it really is never a personal, you know, thing. It's really not about the quality of your work. It's just about what was working for that product at that time 
for that buyer, for that particular subjective, you know, opinion. So moving forward and getting started and understanding that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not personal. You can, you know, just, just roll with it and be persistent and you will get there. You'll start making those connections and start having that success that you're hoping for. That's perfect. Awesome. That's perfect. It's not you. It's me. (laughs) It really is, though. It's so true. I mean, it it absolutely is. The stories of because I've been in those meetings, I've been in those design meetings and Mm -hmm. and the things that, you know, are the reason why one thing is rejected and one thing is is bought is so, so, so unrelated to the quality of the art. Yeah. It's what fits on the shelf. We have four other red designs, so there's no way we're buying this red design. We're definitely buying this blue design, you know, or right. we did peacocks last year and sales were medium. So we're not doing this peacock. We're a hundred percent getting the whatever other animal. Llama. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, we just want to thank you for being here with us today, Elizabeth. It's been awesome learning so many things from you about surface pattern design and about just getting started and getting that courage to get out there and do it. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate what you guys are putting out there because I'm I'm sort of vying for like a third chair in this podcast because (laughs) I really this is I hope this wasn't an audition because I didn't do great, but I (laughs) no I um, (laughs) I I really love if anyone's sick. At least you didn't spill water all over yourself like I did. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. And drop your mic on the floor. (laughs) Uh, Fair enough, fair enough. Laura, leave that in. Yes. (laughs) For our listeners, this happened before we hit record. Yes. (laughs) For today's Star to Society show notes and links to all things Elizabeth Silver, go to stardustsociety.com slash Elizabeth Silver. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. Reviews help us reach more stardusts like you and keep us inspired to continue creating new episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.